thank you, all of you, for being here in this room and everyone present via the camera. It's wonderful to celebrate this occasion with you all. My students were disappointed this afternoon when I walked in the classroom and they said, is that the shirt you are wearing today? <laughs> is this better? <laughs> Thank you. In Dutch, we have a saying that says, driemaal is scheepsrecht. And translated literally, that means something like, third time is the maritime law, which I guess illustrates the Dutch as a seafaring nation. Translated into English, it is quite close to the saying that says, four times the charm. Two earlier dates were planned for this inaugural, and I'm really glad that at least the third time it did happen, and let's hope we will be more lucky indeed to the, today. Some years ago, the, Ken the late Kenyan literary writer, Binyabanga Wainaina, came out by publishing a literary story with the title, I am a homosexual mum. In this beautiful and intimate story, he reimagines the last days of his mother's life, telling her, on her deathbed, the truth about his sexuality. Wanaina's revelation caused a splash in Kenya, the country where he was a well-known literary and public figure, and also a country where homosexuality is legally banned, and surrounded by social, political, cultural and religious taboo. For Wainaina, coming out as gay was a deeply political move. In his own almost messianic words, he framed his coming out as an intervention in a moment in time, and he referred specifically to the um, development in Uganda and Nigeria at that time. Uh, both countries were passing new anti-gay laws uh, at that moment. Further expanding his intervention, Wainaina also released a six-part video commentary titled We Must Free Our Imaginations. <coughs> In Wainaina's analysis, the recent politicization of homosexuality that had taken place on the African continent since the late 1990s is the result of the African imagination continuing to be colonized. After all, it were the British colonizers who introduced anti-sodomy laws in their colonies. And it were European Christian missionaries who introduced a norm of heterosexual, monogamous marriage and nuclear family life. Decades after African countries had gained political independence, the emergence of a new wave of social, political and religious homophobia, for Wainaina exemplified the bankruptcy of a certain kind of imagination because colonial norms of sexuality continue to define African attitudes and laws. Echoing Ngugi Wachungo's highly influential essay, Decolonizing the Mind, Wainaina argued, it is our job, our generation, to say we are in charge of the future. We are in charge of our fate. In his video commentary, Wainaina discusses at length the role of popular Christian movements, in particular Pentecostal charismatic movements, in Africa, fueling homophobia. He sees Pentecostalism as a highly conservative movement that continues the colonization of African minds. In his own words, public space in Kenya and across the African continent is squashed by Pentecostal demon hunters, who are particularly concerned with hunting the demon of homosexuality. Christianity, especially in its Pentecostal form, for Wainaina is an obstacle in the much needed process for Africans to free their imagination, to decolonize the mind and to take charge of their own future. Wainaina is certainly not alone in this analysis. For instance, the great Nigerian writer and public intellectual and Leeds alumnus, Wola Soyinka, speaks of popular religion especially Pentecostalism, as something that threatens the very fabric of the continent. However, as a progressive pan-African thinker, Wainaina also acknowledged 
that there are other possibilities within Christianity. In a long Facebook post from 2015, he invoked the Jesus of James Baldwin and Martin Luther King, that is, the prophetic gospel of black progressive religious thought and of the civil rights movement. Now, you might think, okay, King was a pastor, but what about James Baldwin? What had he to do with Jesus? A lot, but that's a topic for another lecture. This Jesus, the Jesus of James Baldwin and Martin Luther King, according to Wanaina, critiques popular form of Christianity on the African continent. The Jesus Christ sold to Africans today, often for weekly cash money, is a rich, white man. He is not the Jesus who overturned the political party of the Pharisees, who were determined to keep the most poor and marginalized broken down. Our Jesus wants a gated community, wants diversity deleted. Our Jesus wants us to condemn ourselves, tear our hearts apart, beat up our lesbian sister, attack our Muslim neighbor. For Barnaina, the black Jesus of James Baldwin and Martin Luther King is the real Jesus of the gospel, bringing liberation to the most marginalized. I'm opening this lecture with a discussion of Wainaina's thought about Christianity, sexuality, and imagination, partly because Wainaina himself has been an important figure in my recent work on Christianity and sexuality in Africa. And just to share a personal anecdote, back in 2014, I responded to his message on Twitter, in which he called for someone to accompany him to a dinner party in London. I never told the Faculty Research com uh, com Committee about this method of <laughs> recruiting um, research participants. Neither am I sure which of the two criteria alluded to in this tweet I, I met. <laughs> but I had the privilege of meeting him at that dinner in London and a couple of months later at his um, house in Nairobi, where we talked about religion, politics, sexuality, literature, while sharing food and a bottle of whiskey. Wanaina also showed up a year later at the British Institute in Eastern Africa, just at the moment that I was about to give a paper titled Binyawanga Wanaina as a Queer Prophet. And I have to say, it was a bit nerve-wracking to have the prophet himself in the room. Wanaina stepped on World AIDS Day 2016 to share his HIV status by tweeting that he was HIV positive and happy has been an inspiration for me personally to engage in a similar act of personal, embodied and intimate self-disclosure. And it is one example of how my research participants have, have enriched me personally, politically and academically and how they have shaped my research positionality. Unfortunately, when I died, just a few months before my book, Kenyan Christian Queer, which has a chapter about him, was published. Yet the discussion about Wanaina, with which I opened, is also important because it brings us to the heart of the question central in this lecture. Can Christianity be part of a progressive imagination of sexuality in contemporary Africa? And I wish I had given you red and, red and green cards so that we could do a poll um, about your response to that uh, question. This question has become more pertinent in recent years as heated debates about decolonization have re-emerged, as well as debates about queer politics in Africa. Highly influential scholars such as Kwame Bediako, John Mbiti and Lamin Sane argued already years ago that Christianity can be considered an African religion. But recent debates make us ponder the question again. Is there a decolonial future for Christianity on the African continent? And related to that, can Christianity contribute to what Stella Nyanzi has called the queering of queer Africa? Clearly, Wanana himself was rather sceptical about both questions. 
yet he did not preclude the possibility altogether. And some of you may have felt equally sceptic about the title of today's lecture. Isn't it a contradiction in terminus to think Africa, Christianity, and sexual diversity together? Many of us who have an interest in African affairs and or in LGBT human rights have grown accustomed to reports such as this about religious leaders and organizations driving conservative politics of sexuality in Africa and fervently opposing the rights of sexual minorities. Most recently in Ghana, a new anti-gay bill was proposed, enthusiastically endorsed by many religious leaders. In March this year, clerics from Pentecostal, Methodist, Catholic and other denominations organized a national prayer. You would hope that they were praying for prosperity and peace in the country, or that they used the occasion to pray and warn about climate change or whatever other important issue. But no, their primary concern was homosexuality, a detestable sin to God. A lot can be said about the reasons why much of Christianity in Ghana and across the African continent has become so deeply invested in these moral panics by reinforcing the idea of homosexuality as a danger to the family and as a threat to the nation and as something at odds with African values. Two books that I edited with Ezra Titondo a couple of years ago offer detailed analysis of these dynamics in a range of African countries. They carefully unpack how public religion in post-colonial Africa has come to manifest itself in clash with increasingly public forms of non-normative sexuality. In this lecture, however, my interest is a different one. In recent years, I have become increasingly interested in the ways in which religion is also part of counter-mobilizations. Empirically, this interest was informed by my observation, and perhaps my surprise, that many of the queer folk I met during my research, initially in Zambia and later in Kenya, often identified as Christian, and not only that, but also in many cases were active churchgoers. Somehow they found ways to negotiate their sexuality and their faith in the face of very intense religiously driven homophobia. Many queer activists and artists across the continent engage with resources from Christian traditions in creative ways in order to claim visibility and recognition. Theoretically, my interest was also inspired by the notion that public religion is always a space of contestation, open to multiple and conflicting interpretations. And Pentecostalism, as my students in my, in my module, Pentecostalism as a, module, as a public religion in Africa know, Pentecostalism as a highly public and dynamic religion is particularly prone to such public contestations as well as innovation. As a scholar with feminist, decolonial and queer commitments, I am committed to exploring and foregrounding counter discourses that emerge from the margins. Because such counter discourses help us to debunk any generalizing narrative about Africa, religion and homophobia. They also help to identify the potential for social, political and religious change. It is of vital importance to acknowledge the complexity and multiplicity both of the African continent, which I think is a key task of any African studies scholar, and of religion, which is a key task of any religious studies scholar. The complexity and multiplicity of Christianity in Africa in particular has motivated Azonze Yuka, among other scholars, to argue for the plural term African Christianities. The plural in Yuka's words, is to emphasize these different strands or traditions that may or may not be compatible to one another. So as much as the center of gravity of global Christianity has shifted, has shifted southwards, with Africa becoming, or having become, its most important heartland, we should not think of this global south Christianity as the next Christendom in any monolithic term. 
as Toyin Falola puts it, there are multiple faces to the question of Christianity and social, social change in Africa. The plurality and constant innovation of African Christianity opens a range of possibilities to imagine African Christian futures, including, I dare to suggest, queer affirming ones. Pondering about what he calls Afro-queer futurity, Kwame Otu writes, African queer Christianity, an interesting twist. These analytics, never construed as entangled, share such productive affinity. But how to explore this affinity? The central claim that Ezra Chitondo and I make in our recently published book, Reimagining Christianity and Sexual Diversity in Africa, is that a variety of African thinkers, writers, artivists and activists have already begun to reimagine Christi Christian traditions in support of the quest for sexual diversity. They do so by creatively and critically engaging religious texts, symbols, imagery, language, in order to explore the possibilities of queer African futures. And in what follows, I will talk through a couple of examples from different parts of the continent and representing a variety of genres to give you a broad introduction to how this reimagination is taking place. And as you can see from this list of genres I will be exploring, the longer this lecture take, the more fun it will become. <laughs> My own entry into the field of the study of religion in Africa and African studies more generally was through the study of African theology. While studying at Utrecht, I became somewhat disappointed, <laughs> frustrated with the overwhelmingly Eurocentric focus of my curriculum at the time. I developed an interest in contextual theologies in which questions of Christian faith and practice are directly related to concrete social and political challenges and realities. Given a chance to do a special option module where I could choose my own focus, as a young student who had grown up on the Dutch Bible Belt and who had never been to any part of Africa, I decided, for reasons that I still don't fully remember, to study the work of Ghanaian theologian Mercy Amba Odioye. Often referred to as the mother of African women's theology, Odioye has made a major contribution to reimagining Christian faith in African contexts through the lens of women's experiences. She critically unpacks how missionary Christianity arrived in a patriarchal guise, reinforcing the patriarchal traditions already present. In her analysis, this resulted in women being marginalized in the Christian church and directly laid the foundation for violence against women in society today. But going beyond this critique, Odioye develops a theological hermeneutics that blends African cultural and religious traditions with biblical texts and key tenets of the Christian faith and with women's life experiences. And doing so, she creatively develops a theology that affirms women's dignity and, right, and rights and empowers them in their quest for life, justice and healing. At the heart of Odioye's theological project, is a reimagination of God through African women's eyes, such as reflected in the following two poems from her hand. God, growing up in my father's house at the missionary's feet, I saw you as a gray bearded white man from a far away land, a large, all seeing, all knowing eye, stern and demanding, thundering. Throw away your brass, your woods, and stone idols, they said. He is a jealous God, so serve no one but he. Burn your totems and change your name. Save your souls from heresy. Compare this poem to the second one. God is the life force that surges through one woman and causes her to drag the children to, to shelter from the elements, that's God. The sense of worthiness that drives a young woman to face the authorities and to tell them, now is the time, that's God. The constancy with which all creation seeks to increase, multiply to maintain, 
their communities on earth and sky. That's God. God is life. God is worthiness. God is a constant community. What we see in these two poems is the shift in Odioye's perception of the divine, from the colonial, patriarchal and oppressive God introduced by white missionaries to the divine imagined through the eyes of a black African woman, affirming the human quest for justice, for life, for freedom and community. I ended up writing an extended essay about Odioye, and my lecturer at the time invited me to give a presentation to undergraduate students about it, which must have been the first class that I ever taught. What I didn't know at that time, but discovered years later, was that Odioye, out of her feminist theological concern with women's position in church and society, was also one of the first African theologians who, in her publications, openly denounced homophobia and heteronormativity and expressed a genuine concern with sexual minorities. As early as 1993, she wrote an essay in which she stated to be horrified by the demonization of homosexuals. And she drew a direct parallel between homophobia and what she called the phobia of childlessness, experienced by childless women in Africa a reality that she knows personally too well. A later publication in which Odioye writes about her own experience as a married but childless woman can be read not only as an African feminist, but also as a queer theological text. Here she proposes a theology of fruitfulness that goes beyond the norm of biological procreation. She calls upon the church to acknowledge the diversity of God's gifts and to celebrate all the ways of bringing forth life. That is, the many different ways in which human beings can lead a fruitful life, regardless of their reproductive capacities, their marital status, their gender identity, or their sexual orientation. Together with the legendary Desmond Tutu from South Africa, Odioye is among the first black African theologians to engage in a progressive theological imagination in which Christianity enhances the quest for sexual justice. For each of them, this was inspired by their primary concern with a different category. In Tutu's case, the category of race and his personal experience of apartheid. In Odioye's case, the category of gender and her personal struggle with patriarchy. Building on this principle, any emerging African queer theology is intersectional. As the popular saying goes, justice denied to one is justice denied to all. And in the light of recent developments in Ghana, it is comforting to know that one of the most influential theologians that the country has produced is in fact highly critical of these developments of these popular Christian anti-gay politics and has provided a strong basis for alternative ways of thinking. By discussing Odioye's work, I also acknowledge the importance of engaging with African theology as part of the broader study of religion in Africa. And as some of the religious studies and, theologian, religious studies and theologians in this room um, might know, there has been an endless debate, and there is still an endless debate, but about theology versus religious studies that keeps going on in European institutions. In my personal impression, these debates are not particularly helpful and useful in African contexts. After all, in Africans, theologians play an active societal role. Theological discourse is part of the public domain. And academia is not necessarily conceived of as a secular space. So I have come to embrace a multidisciplinary approach that mobilizes a wide range of methodological tools and that combines emic and etic insider and outsider perspectives to examine and understand the multiple dimensions and roles of religion as part of African social worlds. In my own work, I have become increasingly interested in an approach that considers religion as part of African cultural production in all its various genres and forms, from literature to movies, 
from music to social media, from, Afri from popular culture to street art. And one of the potentials of this approach is that it draws attention to the arts broadly defined as a space of creative engagement with and contestation of public religion. Contemporary African arts and cultural production mediate the negotiation, resistance, innovation and transformation of religious belief and practice in the public sphere. That is, they are vital to the reimagination of religion. And as such, cultural production, in the words of Gibson Gube, also plays a pivotal role in creating alternate spaces in which LGBT or queer individuals and groups can freely and openly embrace their differences. One important part of African cultural production is literary writing. And I'm honored to work at an institution where the study of African literature is deeply ingrained in our institutional history and present. Personally, I've always loved reading. As I did, as a kid, my dad would read for us. And a few years later, my mum my took us to the library every Friday evening. And each of us, I think, would get home with uh, at least five books. I think actually five was the maximum that we could get. But anyway, in the next week, we would read these books and return them and um, come back with another uh, pile of books. So I'm grateful to my parents for introducing me in the wonderful and imaginative world of books. Taking up that love of reading again, I've recently developed a new project on African literature, giving myself an alibi to read more novels and count it as work. In post-colonial African literature, Christianity has often been critiqued for its intricate connection to the history of colonialism. The classics by Chinua Achebe, Things Fall Apart, and Gugi Wachongo, The River Between, are in case in point. However, for a new generation of African writers, Christianity is not so much something that comes from outside of the continent, but it has become part of African social realities that is rooted in African social milieus. So recent literary texts allow for a critical, but also a nuanced and constructive engagement with Christianity. Moreover, recent African literary texts have engaged with the hitherto controversial theme of same-sex relationships. And a fascinating example of a text that intersects these two themes is the novel Under the Udala Trees by the Nigerian Igbo writer Chinolo Okparonta. This beautiful novel presents a female same-sex love story in a narrative that includes plenty of references to religion. For the protagonist, Ioma, the church and especially the culture of Pentecostal charismatic prayer, Bible study and deliverance, is presented as a hindrance in the process of coming to terms with his sexuality. Yet, the novel presents a multifaceted and a nuanced account, opening up alternative ways of imagining Christianity. For instance, Ioma herself begins to question her mother's interpretation of the Bible and suggests that the creation story about Adam and Eve can be read as underlining companionship in multiple forms. Responding to the popular arguments, the popular saying against homosexuality, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Haven't we all heard that? Um, Ioma muses, just because the story happens to focus on a certain Adam and Eve does not mean that all other possibilities are forbidden. What if Adam and Eve were merely symbols of companionship? The novel thus reinterprets the Genesis account of creation. It takes Adam and Eve as a narrative model, not of gender complementarity and compulsory heterosexuality, but of human difference, companionship, and relationality. That can be found in multiple and equally viable forms. Okparanta advances here a queer biblical hermeneutics avant la lettre, and she does so in a way that is distinctly Igbo by bringing in the motive of the Udala tree that is central in the novel's title and that appears throughout the novel. 
Now, I'm not an expert on Igbo uh, religion and culture, and my PhD student who is, is actually currently doing fieldwork in uh, Igbo land, um, so I wasn't able to check with her. But if I am right, the Udala tree is highly symbolic in Igbo cultural and religious traditions, as it is associated with both innocence and fertility. In the novel, the symbolic meaning of the Udala tree appears to merge with that of the biblical tree of knowledge. The tree becomes a symbol of losing innocence, gaining knowledge and maturity, and exploring multiple ways of being fruitful. Obviously, the Bible plays an important role in African, in African societies, not just in the religious sphere, narrowly defined, but also in society and in the public sphere much more generally. And as such, the Bible is often used to reinforce conservative attitudes towards sexual diversity. Addressing and interrogating this, Ioma ponders, change is a major part of God's aesthetic, a major part of God's vision for the world. The Bible itself is an endorsement of change. Maybe God is still speaking and will continue to do so for always. Maybe he is still creating new covenants. Only we were too deaf, too headstrong, too set in old ways to hear. Moreover, Ioma's staunchly conservative mother, who throughout the novel uses the language of abomination and deliverance in relation to her daughter, at the end of the book concludes, God who created you must have known what he did. So Okparanta's suggestion is not only that God is open to change and that the Bible is not static, but that even the staunchest Christian can be transformed in their minds and attitudes. And throughout the novel, Okparanta explores the possibility of alternative imaginings of Christian faith in relation to sexuality. Putting Okparanta's notion of the Bible as an endorsement of change into practice. Over the past couple of years, I have worked with my amazing colleague, Johanna Stiebert, and with a community-based organization of LGBT uh, refugees in Kenya, the Nature Network, which is equally amazing. We work together on a project about retelling Bible stories from LGBT refugee perspectives. And it was the most fun, but also the most moving and enriching piece of research I've ever been involved in. From them, I learned that one of the secrets of African queer existence is joy and creativity and the joy of being creative. The very basic idea of this project was the following, in the words of our wonderful research uh, coordinator, Raymond Bryan. In this project, we creatively used stories from the Bible to tell our own life experiences as LGBTI refugees. The Bible is often used against us, but in this project, we reclaim it as a book that affirms and empowers us. In this film, we use the stories about Daniel in the homophobic clown's den to play out the drum the anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda to celebrate our liberation. Um, according to Raymond Bryan, the Bible is often used against us, but in this project we reclaim it as a book that affirms and empowers us. As Sarojini Nadar has argued, such a dialogical and transformative process of rescripting sacred texts is particularly important given the prominent status of the Bible in many African societies and its role as a site of struggle in issues of sexual diversity. Our premise in this project was that by interreading life stories and Bible stories, new sacred stories would emerge. And so they did. As one of our research participants put it, the Bible is a book of life, and we should use it to reveal our lives. To capitalize on the power of storytelling, we enacted these new liberating stories through drama. Daniel! Yes? Hey, you have been released by the president. Oh, you are free. I knew this from happening, guys. Woo! God has helped me. Ah. 
I will get up by the power of God. And you will get a sense of how the Bible story about Daniel in the lion's den was retold in the contemporary context and in the light of the life experiences of our participants um, after the passing of the anti-homosexuality bill in uh, Uganda. And in our retelling of this story, the biblical Daniel becomes a gay rights activist who is resisting the anti-homosexuality bill, who after the bill is passed through parliament and up in prison, but, as in the Bible story, is miraculously released and is able to, read, to lead his life in freedom. The drama films, as well as the stories that we published in the book Sacred Queer Stories, are a testimony to Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's uh, claim that stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And as much as the Bible is indeed a site of struggle, it can be creatively reclaimed as an African text and as a queer text by marginalized communities to affirm and empower themselves and to retell the stories of their lives in a liberating way. Another major genre of African cultural production is audiovisual text. In recent years, queer-themed videos have emerged from different parts of the continent demonstrating the emerging method of visual activism. Let me discuss two Kenyan texts that can be seen as contributing to a reimagination of Christianity. First, the film Rafiki, directed by Wanuru Kahiu and released to white acclaim in 2018. Rafiki tells the story of a romance developing between two young women, Kana and Ziki in an urban Kenyan setting and amidst family pressures, as well as the socio-political contestation over gay rights in Kenya. In the film, Christianity is part of everyday life. We see Christian imagery and language, language throughout the film. Kenna's mother is depicted as a deeply religious figure. The church is an important part of the neighborhood and the pastor an influential figure. Christianity is depicted as a driving force in the struggle that Kana and Ziggy face when their friendship develops into a blossoming love. The pastor delivers a sermon that is typical of religious anti-gay speech widely prevalent in Kenya and other countries on the continent. There are Kenyans, he preaches, who are challenging the government because of their stance on homosexuality and same-sex marriage. They say it's a human right but what is a human right? Isn't it God who decides what is right and what isn't? Later in the film, Kana is taken to church, where her mother asks the pastor to pray over her daughter and deliver her from the demon possessing her. So the film addresses the widespread notion that homosexuality is the result of demon possession and that the queer body is in need of deliverance. However, the deliverance fails. Kana is as tomboyish and as same-sex loving after the ritual as she was before. So the film suggests that sexual orientation is not something that can be healed or corrected through any spiritual intervention. And the pastor's claim that God's laws don't change is subtly interrogated in the film when in the opening shot it shows a religious text written somewhere on a wall, reading, I have no other God but you. You have done what no man has done. You will do what no man can do. At first sight, this image illustrates the way in which Christian language influences public space and has become part of the aesthetic of modern urban life. However, this specific text entails a promise and can be read as prophetic. Watching the film, one might reach the conclusion that gay rights are impossible in Kenya. However, this slogan suggests that with God all things are possible, 
and the positive ending of the film underlines this optimistic message. Kana and Ziki are reunited many years later. Love will prevail. Queer love is possible. Where the film Rafiki is somewhat subtle in bringing across this alternative imagination of Christianity, the music video Same Love is much more explicit. Produced by George Barassa and released in 2016, this film ends with a quotation from the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, love is selfless, love is full of trust, love is not proud, God is love, and love is God. Reading the film as a form of visual activism, the use of the Bible here is highly strategic, as it reacclaims sacred scripture from a largely homophobic church and uses it to affirm the dignity, the validity of love in its multiple forms. The video explicitly claims that queer love finds its origins in God, the source of love. Moreover, the video interrogates the criminalization of homosexuality in Kenya and other parts of Africa, explicitly referring to Uganda and Nigeria. According to the song, it's time for new laws, not time for new wars. We come from the same God, cut from the same cord, share the same pain and share the same skin. The march is still on. Luther's spirit lives on. The song reflects the Pan-African belief in the unity, the equality and the solidarity of black and African people as created by God, united in a history of struggle and in a quest for justice and liberation. Indeed, the song refers to the spirit of Martin Luther King and claims that this spirit is living on in Africans fighting for the dignity and rights of queer folk today. This emerging discourse of queer Pan-Africanism is inspired by religious, in particular Christian thought. And as such, it not only advances a reimagination of Africa, helping to imagine queer African futures, but also of Christianity in Africa, with faith being mobilized to imagine a continent, the cradle of humankind, that embraces human diversity and guarantees the freedom for all its people. Achille Mbembe has stated that struggle as a praxis of liberation has always drawn part of its imaginary resources from Christianity. He makes this observation in relation to the history of slavery and the civil rights movement in North America. And as we know, music was a crucial method through which those suffering from slavery and the systematic in racism kept hopeful and engaged in imaginative practices. And this history reminds us that reimagination is always born out of struggle, a struggle reflected in the gospel spirituals that emerged from the plantation. Now, music is also central in contemporary African religious cultures. Gospel music, according to Damaris Parsitao, is the fastest growing musical expression in many parts of Africa today. And the significance and meaning of particular songs and lyrics is always contextual. During my ethnographic research with queer Christians in Africa, in Kenya, over the past couple of years, I was struck by the importance of gospel music in this community and I can't interpret this in another way than that gospel songs for them too are born out of struggle and represent an imaginative practice of faith. I love the way you handle my sins. 
situation. I love the way you fight for me. This particular song, I Love the Way You Handle My Situations, was the most popular song in cosmopolitan affirming church, an LGBT affirming Christian community in Nairobi, at the time that I was conducting my field work with them. And these lyrics of this song, I love the way you handle my situations, I love the way you fight for me, are especially meaningful, taking into account the struggles that church members have been going through and the challenges that they still face in their day-to-day -day lives because of their sexuality. In the context of CAC, this song becomes a song of empowerment and encouragement for queer people of faith. Indeed, this song reflects a reimagination of Christianity, with God being imagined as a source of affirmation, acceptance, support, and even defense of queer folk, many of which face exclusion marginalization in their communities. Ngugi Bachungo has said about the African-American spirituals that they represent an aesthetic of resistance with a force of beauty and an imagery of hope. These same very words apply to the beautiful songs of the CAC choir. By thanking God for fighting for them, they also claim that God is on their side in the struggle for existence and recognition. And by endlessly repeating this song, the song becomes, empowered, becomes performative. It becomes a performative anticipation that this struggle will be won. By singing, they imagine. And they help to create a world, the world they are hoping for. A world of love and acceptance, of dignity and rights, of justice and freedom. When I won Obinyan, hi I won, David Ochar and I produced the documentary film Kenyan Christian Queer. We tried to capture the important role of gospel music for African queer world making in the opening of the film. Sunday, a group of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender Christians gather to worship at the Cosmopolitan Affirming Community. Affectionately known as CAC, this is the first LGBT church in Kenya. And I think that uh, the opening fragments of the, of, the, of the film do indeed reflect the, the importance of music and reflect this aesthetic of resistance, a force of beauty and an imagery of hope. Last but not least, one final example of creative forms of the appropriation and reimagination of Christianity in Africa. And perhaps the most unexpected one, drag performance. And the example in question comes from South Africa, the country of my first personal encounter with the African continent. First, when as a teenager, we had two South African girls staying with us um, as a family. Do you still remember? Um, and my sister was teasing me that I was in love with one of them. <laughs> she was wrong. My second encounter with South Africa was a couple of years later when I was a visiting student in the Theology and HIV AIDS program at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And I have returned to South Africa several times uh, since then. And my experiences there are forever inscribed in my body and the memories in my heart. And one of these memories is a community hall in the Cape Flats area at the outskirts of Cape Town, far away of the modern gay capital uh, image of Cape Town. 
and I had been invited to attend a performance by one of South Africa's most fabulous drag queens, Belinda Kwakomba Fossey. In their arts, Fossey weaves together in a beautiful way their family history, the struggle and the beauty of black and queer existence, the vitality of indigenous traditions, as well as of Christianity. And in this particular show, Fossey paid tribute to their grandmother by dressing in the traditional church uh, uniform of the Methodist women's movement. With the same authenticity and creativity, Fossey at other occasions performed songs from South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle and wears dresses that remind of indigenous Xhosa ritual. Fossey's performances illustrate what Jose Esteban Munoz has called practices of disidentification by queer artists of color, bringing together hitherto seemingly opposed categories, blackness and queerness, indigenous religion and Christian symbols, tradition and modernity. And doing so, she performs a world that is yet to come, a utopian performativity imbued with a sense of potentiality. A black queer body, wearing a Methodist church uniform, carrying a cross with an image of the black consciousness leader, Steve Biko. This is drag as a performative, as a creative imagination, as a radical political form of art. With some colleagues in South Africa, I'm currently developing a research project into black queer creative practices, such as the one presented by Kwakamba Fossey, and the way in which they present us with a fascinating as assemblage of sexuality, race, and the sacred. Such performative practices speak back to the queer body, which in Eurocentric queer studies tends to be conceptualized as Western, as white, as secular. And they put religion, spirituality, and faith at the heart of African queer world making. To conclude, I opened this lecture with a question posed by Binyabanga Wanaina. Can Christianity be part of a progressive reimagination of sexual diversity in Africa? With the history of European colonialism and Christian imperialism, and with the present role of Christianity in anti-LGBT politics on the continent, many will be tempted to answer this question in a negative way, and for understandable reasons. Yet at the same time, as I have demonstrated, this reimagination is already taking place, whether liberal and or secular thinkers and activists may like it or not. Creatively and courageously, new possibilities of faith and sexuality in Africa are imagined and are beginning to transform the present, making queer existence possible with all its vulnerabilities, with lots of joy and energy in the quest for abundance of life. True, it is a relatively marginal phenomenon, and it is yet to be seen what its long-term impact is going to be. Some critics of my work have challenged me to pay more attention to the social, political and economic conditions in which the kind of imaginative practices that I've been talking about can materialize and will generate long-term effect. And certainly that is a fair and an important question to ask especially for social scientists and political economists. But the value of arts and humanities research is also in identifying and exploring creative and critical narratives that emerge from the margins, even if those narratives don't seem viable at the time. From Martin Luther King, we know that any struggle for justice, any movement for social, political and religious transformation starts with a dream. And with the risk of ending this lecture as a, as a sermon, which might be to the joy of my mom, who I think still hopes that one day I will become a clergyman, this is a dream, in King's word, for a dead day when all God's children will be free at last. Finally, 
delivering this lecture today, I am grateful to each and every one who has supported me in my academic journey, which in many ways has also been a very personal journey. I'm particularly grateful to the intellectually vibrant, but also socially supportive and very collegial community here at Leeds, both in the School of Philosophy, Religion and History of Science, the subject area of theology and religious studies, the Center of Religion and Public Life, and the Leeds University Center for African Studies. If there is one major reason why I truly enjoy working at Leeds, it is the presence of truly wonderful colleagues, but also truly wonderful students, with, with whom I have the opportunity to share my interests, my passions, and um, instill these passions in them. Today, I feel honored to stand in and further build a tradition of studying religion in Africa here at Leeds. And I'm grateful to the work of my predecessor, Kevin Ward, and his predecessor, Adrian Hastings, in establishing this tradition. Having said so, I must confess that I also feel rather uncomfortable about the fact that I am the third white man embodying that tradition. And I am embarrassed to become a white, another white male professor in a school, in a faculty, in a university, with an overwhelmingly white staff body. Nationwide, not even 1% of professors in the UK are black. 1%. Much could and needs to be said about the imperative to diversify, to diversify the staff body here at Leeds, in the field of African studies, in the field of religious studies, in the UK higher education sector at large. I will keep pushing this agenda. I'm warning you. <laughs> and here at this university and beyond. And I will also keep supporting students and colleagues of color wherever I can. Let me not say more about it at this occasion. Today, I have instead performed a more symbolic gesture in an attempt to decenter white male scholarship and to acknowledge the politics of knowledge production and citation. In this lecture, I have extensively cited, relied, and built on the work of black African scholars, writers, and artivists. I hope this brings across the message that diversifying our reading lists and our curriculum is possible if we make intentional effort. And as much as this inaugural lecture is an occasion to celebrate me and my work, and therefore automatically centers me, I wish to make it very clear that I couldn't have achieved anything without my research participants, my colleagues and friends on the African continent. They generously shared with me their knowledge, their life experiences, their stories, their embodied world making. I have learned so much from them, from you, and I have been truly enriched. So in the spirit of Ubuntu, I say, I am because you are. Asanta Sana, thank you so much.